lying in bed um, with some nasal problem of, of some sort at my prep school, Luglev, and um, reading, I think it was a daily sketch, uh, I saw a tiny headline saying, Boy of Nine, and because I was nine years old myself, I looked to see what Boy of Nine had done. To my complete astonishment, uh, I read that Hugh Edward Conway Seymour had become the eighth Marquis of Harford on the death of his uncle. And I thought, I really did wonder for a moment if there could be some other little boy of nine also called Hugh Edward Conway Seymour. And then I thought, no, the, 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 that, can't, that can't be. Uh, but I didn't even know I had an uncle called Lord Harford. Because the new Lord Harford was only a child, trustees were appointed to run Ragley on his behalf. During the war, they made the house available to the Red Cross as a hospital for wounded soldiers. It only made Ragley all the more exciting for the young Lord Harford. Oh, it's wonderful. It's, it's a wonderful house for children. And of course, <clears throat> during the war, when the house was a hospital, although this film was rather out of bounds because it, it, was, it had 50 beds in it, I always had partners for tennis because it was a convalescent hospital and so there were always a few patients uh, who were ready, able and willing to play tennis with me. In 1946 the hospital closed and the Red Cross said goodbye to Ragley, leaving the house back in the care of the family. Uh, the Red Cross had paid for the central heating and my mother then decided we couldn't afford the central heating. I don't know if we really couldn't or not. But the winter of 1947 was bitterly cold and we had no heating at all. We just had rather small log fires. When Lord Harford was 17, his mother and the trustees decided that it was no longer practical to live at Ragley and that the family should move out. My mother moved to a farmhouse, oh, only about a mile from here. Um, a farmhouse on the estate, you know. I did hate it. Horace Walpole, for instance, who fits quite nicely over the fireplace there, in, in the farmhouse dining room, he was floor to ceiling. <laughs> and looked ridiculous as a result. Um, and so much of our furniture is quite big, and it, it, no, I, I never felt comfortable there. I really hated it, but all, it was more than that. It was, of course, an admission of defeat as far as I was concerned. Um, and I was absolutely determined to move back into this house as soon as possible. The trustees stayed in control of the house and estate until Lord Harford was 21. They believed the family would never live at Ragley again, and they allowed the house to slide into disrepair. Then they decided that Ragley Hall should be demolished. It was an appalling idea, and I really was horrified, uh, so I did what I'd been told was the rudest thing you could possibly do. I sent all my trustees postcards in pencil, saying, I hope the subject of the demolition of Ragley will never again be mentioned. Hugh Harford had prevented his trustees from demolishing Ragley, but he still had to find a way to keep the building standing. It was a problem faced by aristocrats across the country. At Ragley, Hugh Harford applied for a grant to restore the roof. When the money was slow to arrive, he applied some pressure. I was asked to give a talk to the Council for the Preservation of Royal England uh, in London. And so I took the opportunity and I told the press in advance that I was going to make a reasonably important statement and it was, in fact, televised, as well as attracting a lot of press. And I announced that, unless I got government help, Ragley would have to be pulled down, which uh, I must admit was bluff. <laughs> um, luckily, my bluff was not called. I did get a very large government grant. In fact, at the time, it was the biggest grant that it had ever been given to any house. the chance to meet a real live aristocrat. Water skiing. We got going and we built a, a, a ski jump. I fell in the first 17 times I went over it. And we put a, 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 a flaming hoop over it with, with straw covered in tar and, and set fire to it and jumped through that and thousands of people came. 
And it really was a huge success, because at that time, 1960, nobody or very few people had ever even seen water skiing, unless they'd been to the south of France or somewhere. So it was a new thing, and Birmingham flocked in vast numbers and cheered every time I fell in, which was quite awful. And I remember there was one day uh, after a, a Whit Monday bank holiday when we'd actually had 7,000 people watching the water skiing. And I was driving down to the bank that evening with a little clerk from the estate office who came as my um, sort of escort to be safe. And I was, as I was driving, I was juggling these leather bags full of money. Uh, and uh, I said, do you realize that we have taken enough money in one day to buy a new mo motor car? And gloomy little man, he said, yes, or your lordship could reduce the overdraft. Of course I bought the car, I bought a wonderful Dame Ladard. Mm -hmm. 